So as Sarah mentioned, we are going right into nutrition and the fire service next. And so I am very excited to introduce our two next speakers. Um, first up is Chloe Schweinset, who is, you're going first? Oh, you flipped it, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. So, going up first is Dr. Tracy Crane, who is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She's the co-leader of the Cancer Control Research Program at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Crane's research interests are focused on cancer prevention and control. Her research program designs and tests interventions targeting modifiable lifestyle behaviors, including diet, physical activity, and tobacco use. So first up, Dr. Crane. Wow, thank you guys very much for inviting me. I have to admit, this is my first time ever uh, giving a talk to the and group of firefighters, so thank you for having me and being so welcoming. And our uh, talk could not have been better set up than the previous talk, which is really nice. So we are gonna split this talk into two parts. Mine is really more focused on the cancer prevention science piece of it and the evidence that we have to date. And then the other side of it's gonna be really practical advice. So I always like to start my, start my prevention talks with this quote. Um, it was a quote that uh, one of my first mentors ever always put in his slide decks, and I think it really speaks and holds true, that prevention is better than healing because it saves us the labor of being sick. So when we think about the causes of cancer, you can see here on this list that we have several different ones. The focus of my research is really on these modifiable lifestyle factors. And although today, and you can see, if we look at this chart, quite a few of these are modifiable. They're things that, in fact, we can have some control over. In the previous talk, wow, what a great job you did at saying just 1% better at a lot of these actual things. And so today, although there are several in my research program that I cover, my main true love and focus is really nutrition. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So this is a chart that shows the estimated cancer burden attributable to suboptimal diet in the United States and adults. And so I'm gonna orient you to the graph, and what you can see is on the left-hand side, these are different dietary components. So you can see whole, low in whole grains, a diet, low in total dairy products, high in processed meals, low in vegetables, low in fruit, um, a high red meat consumption, and then high in sugar-sweetened beverages. And then the different colors indicate the evidence that we have for each of the different types of cancers related to those actual dietary components. And what I'll share with you is that it's difficult to study the actual impact diet may have on cancer risk because it takes a very long time to figure, you know, to wait for cancer to happen. It's also challenging to measure diet prospectively, what people ate. So the fact that we actually have these data enough to say there is significant risk with these cancers, you can see that colorectal cancer has the strongest evidence for it. That's the black. The next one is oral uh, cavity and esophageal cancer, which again, previously you also saw. The next one is some of the endometrial cancers and then the breast cancer, kidney, stomach. So you can see that a lot of these cancers are up here and they are directly implicated by um, diet. So hallmarks of cancer, how does this work? So this graph here, which is not on the thing, but hopefully it will be, uh, here we go. So you can see on this graph that, that you can, there's many mechanisms by which cancer evades the immune system and progresses. It evades growth suppression, it can avoid immune destruction, it ha promotes inflammation. Probably the largest risk factor that we know is directly attributable to your diet is through the inflammatory pathway. And so a healthful diet can prevent this gene genetic damage that's caused by endogenous and exogenous agents. We know that it can stimulate the repair of structural and functional genetic defects. It can suppress cancer cell growth and clonal um, evolution. So I like to say that picture's worth a thousand words, right? So if you were to leave an apple on the counter, this is what oxidative stress looks like, right? It turns brown, and the apple, nobody wants to eat that apple. The same thing is happening when you have oxidative stress in your body. And so oxidative stress, is so we know it's associated with cancer risk. It results in damage to DNA that requires repair, and the, to re the repair of DNA may be less effective when you have oxidative conditions. Foods that are, diets that are high in um, plants 
and phytochemicals and nutrients, whole grains, they really help to eliminate and reduce this oxidative stress exposure. The next one that I want to talk about is telomere length, right? So telomeres, I have a picture here. The red caps at the ends are actually the telomeres, and they protect the chromosomes from actually unraveling and shortening. You don't want shortened telomeres. This is not a good thing. You want to have nice, long telomeres. It's associated with a longer and healthier life. And we know that higher telomerase activity promotes stability in telomeres, and we know directly that a diet that's higher quality is associated with better telomerase protect production and leads to you know, less shortening of your telomeres. So what are the actual guidelines? So here's our guidelines from the American Cancer Society. They were just updated last year. And what they are is to be a healthy weight throughout your lifespan, be physically active 150 to 300 minutes per week, um, of moderate activity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous activity. Follow a healthful eating pattern. Well, what does that mean? It's a little bit vague, but it means it's high in vegetables, high in fruit, high in whole grains. It limits red and processed meats, sugar sweetened beverages. This has been something that's been a culprit infiltrating our diet over the last 20 years. Think about, I'm not you know, saying anything negative about Starbucks, but Starbucks are, have been a huge, when you look at our food consumption patterns in, this, in the United States, the single, you know, Starbucks hitting the scene and having um, just the number, sheer number of people drinking these coffees has dramatically changed what our intake looks like. Uh, also, I would say refined grain products. And then this is where I would usually get booed off stage, but we did change the recommendations that we probably should not be drinking alcohol as it's associated to cancer risk. So these are the recommendations. I loved the last talk. I think it's true. It's not probably realistic if you enjoy having an alcoholic beverage, but you can't save up the one drink per week or, the, or one drink per day to the weekend and drink all seven on one shot, right? So that doesn't count. Uh, just be mindful of it and that we do actually see an increased risk for cancer now associated with alcohol. So sadly, Americans are not meeting the guidelines at all. About 90% of Americans do not meet the fruit and vegetable recommendation. Just let that sink in for a minute, 90%. That's a really high number. And overall, fruit and vegetable eating occasions have declined by 10% over the, since 2004, we've lost 10%. So we were 10% better, actually, in 2004 at eating our fruits and vegetables. And so the, what has also been arisen, as I mentioned Starbucks, and I'm not, you know, but coffee, the industry in general with uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, but also just fast food consumption. The average American eats fast food 159 times in a year. On average, it's 1,200 calories per meal. That's at least, probably for most of you, half of your daily intake in one meal. So 1% better maybe is one fast food meal less per week. Um, and that's 190,000 calories per year, you would have to run those calories from New York to Denver. So better get moving, right? So that's going to take a while. And unfortunately, when I started doing the literature, unfortunately, you know, you look like a lot of the rest of America when you look at firefighter, and some of this work may have actually been uh, cited in the previous talk. But when we know, we look at most consumed foods, there's sugar-sweetened beverages, french fries was the most commonly consumed vegetable, salty snacks, and starches from high processed foods. And I will not give away my source, but these are the images when I searched for firefighter foods. In fairness, there were several that were very healthy also that I should have also put a picture up of. But, and I understand, comfort comes from food, but as you think about opportunities to change, and I did not, I made sure I cut out which fire station this came from. Um, but I don't see anything green or orange or red on that plate um, at all. So diet and cancer link for firefighters, I think you guys have already maybe had this drilled into you already, but cancer accounts for 27% of all-cause lifetime mortality in U.S. firefighters. It's the second leading cause of death. They have a statistically increased risk for several types of cancer compared to the general population, and body composition is probably one of the largest things that's driving this. And obesity is a growing problem, and, you know, the average BMI in obesity prevalence is now at, a, at right around 40%. Again, this is not different, though, than the rest of the United States, right? This is a, this is a common problem that we're seeing uh, nationwide. And 67 to 77% of firefighters are either overweight or obese. So how can we do better? And there's unique challenges, I think, that are being faced. You know, there's the, not only the societal obesity epidemic, right? There's a fast food 
um, joint on every corner. They're open 24 hours a day, right? There is no you know, limitation to when you, and the access to healthy foods can be challenging. There's culture and habits, right? I, I enjoy a great meal and I also enjoy comfort food. I enjoy having a, you know, an alcoholic beverage and unwinding, but there are cultures around here that I recognize. I'm not as familiar as others, but I recognize that culture matters and that plays into the food we eat. And then there's shift work, which I think is also contributing potentially to some of this problem. And excess, this is all contributing and adding up to excess body weight and adipose tissue. And so I'm gonna set the stage a little bit for the next talk um, with diet and the microbiome, which is your GI tract and all the good gut bacteria that makes up your intestinal tract and circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are what you have on a daily basis. And light is traditionally the number one trigger for a circadian rhythm. We know that the master clock is in your brain and it sets, it sets your daily rhythm. And food, believe it or not, when the time of day you eat is the number one trigger for your circadian rhythm. So meal timing is important. And when we think about modifiable things that may have a really significant impact, this is manageable, right? When I talk to people about making a small change, thinking about just when you're eating and the dramatic effect it can have on things like insulin and glucose, it's pretty profound. We also know that, the, that not only do you have, as a whole human being, a circadian rhythm, but many of your cells have a circadian rhythm, right? So your, your liver, your, um, your kidneys, your muscle tissues, they all have their own peripheral clocks at each cellular level. And your microbiome also has its own unique rhythm of producing gut flora and all these byproducts that are, are healthy for you. The number one way that you can change your microbiome is probably through your diet, right? We know that you wanna have higher levels of alpha and beta diversity in your bacteria, in your GI tract. High diets, high in vegetables, high in fruit, high in whole grains. We know these directly mo can modify the, the gut microbiota and how you are processing um, the foods that you're eating. Fermented foods are also healthy. Things like yogurt um, can be very helpful too. So think about these things, but your circadian rhythm also directly impacts that microbiome. So there's, there's an opportunity to think about timing of meals and what you're eating. There's lots of places that you can think about doing that 1% better with diet. So opportunities. You know, I also think that there's so much opportunity because as it was mentioned in the previous talk, you have shared meals. You have real opportunity to, to talk with one another about what you may want to do and choices of food that you may want to be having around the table. Camaraderie is a great Motivator. We know from social network studies, like with Framingham, that the influence of one single person changing the way that they're eating can have a direct impact on many people. Um, you, your leaders, right? I mean, my kids love it when they go and they see the fire, the fire truck at the grocery store, right? So you're leading by example. Everybody loves to see you in the community. Maybe not when they're the one in distress, but generally speaking, uh, they love to see you show up. Lifestyle changes could significantly reduce obesity. It can improve your diet quality. Even if you don't see dramatic weight loss, just changing, again, like the gut microbiome, right? Eating a little bit healthier can make significant changes in thinking about when you're on shift and when you're not and when you're eating. And I loved this quote that I came across when I was uh, doing my lit review for this talk because it's not an area I'm as familiar with. And having dinner together is a long-standing tradition and we bond and we share stories and have kitchen talk. I thought that was a great quote that summarized everything that's happening hopefully in the fire departments and stations. And so if I can leave you with anything, I would say the one small change and come together as a group, it definitely can be done and will have significant impacts on your health. And with that, I am going to leave you. There's a few references there that are good references for, the Amer for cancer prevention directly. It's the American Institute for Cancer Research. Every year they do a comprehensive search of the literature about what do we know about food and cancer risk, and then we also have the American Society, uh, American Cancer Society's current guidelines. And I'm happy to share slides if anybody wants them. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chloe for practical advice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crane. Chloe Schwansat is a registered dietitian nutritionist who owns a private practice, Riverside Nutrition. She works with a variety of clients using holistic approach to nutrition and wellness with a particular focus on first responders. 
She has worked with members of Boston Fire Department, New York Fire Department, Cambridge Fire Department, Boston Police, as well as private ambulance services to help them lead a healthier lifestyle with issues such as weight loss, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. She's also a sought after speaker and has spoken at Boston, Boston Fire's Mulane Health and Safety Symposium, as well as FDNY's Uniformed Officers Association, NYC Health and Safety Seminar. In addition, Chloe is a nutrition consultant for O2X, a human performance company that works with for first responder communities. So without further ado, welcome Chloe. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. I am so excited to be talking about nutrition with fire services because with firefighters, there is so much on this job that you can't control, exposures, schedules, what you see, but proper nutrition is absolutely something you can. So my hope today is that you'll walk away with a roadmap on how to make those small changes that'll make a big difference. So the two things that I'm going to focus on today are the two things that when I work with fire departments and individuals, um, we cover. So the first is going along with what Dr. Crane said, talking about shift work and meal timing and the importance of when you eat. The second one is going to be how to reduce your exposures, how to detoxify your body from a nutrition standpoint after you've had certain exposures. So we know that shift work has been linked to a whole host of scary conditions out there, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, depression, and of course, cancer. Your schedule is rough. So chrononutrition, this is an area of nutrition and how it relates to your body's natural circadian rhythm, your natural internal crock, what Dr. Crane was talking about. We know that our circadian rhythm dictates our sleep, it dictates our body temperature, our hormones, as well as our appetite. We know that light and darkness affect it. We know that erratic eating habits can affect it, especially late night eating. We also know that altered sleep schedules affect it, i.e. everyone in this room who is in fire services. Unfortunately, this is a bit of an uphill battle. So why, why do we care? So what we know is that there are magic hours in the night between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. That is our transformation period. This is when our body goes to work. This is when we do all of our repair, our restorations, our waste cleanup. This is when free radical removal happens. This is when hormone secretion happens, including those satiety hormone, leptin, the hunger hormone, ghrelin, and HGH, the fountain of youth, human growth hormones, really important. So after 10 p.m., our body can get that second wind, and we really need that to be used for our body's metabolic repair. In an ideal world, sleep happens, 10, 10.30. However, we know in fire services, that isn't always possible. So there are certain measures we can do to help with that. How we align our body is really important. So eating when it's light out. We know it's what we were meant to do. We know it's better for our digestive health, our gut health, the importance of that gut microbiome is huge. It goes along with our metabolism. Our body doesn't wanna be eating late at night. That reignites our metabolism and tells it to do something when it needs to be saving that energy to go to work for those magic hours that we just talked about. So this is really important for fire services and what I work on a lot with people eat during the day, not at night. So that means if you're on a 24 hour shift and you're working seven to seven or eight to eight, you're eating breakfast, you're eating lunch, you're eating dinner, you're eating a snack or two, you are not eating anything after dinner. You are not eating in the middle of the night. And that's a big change, because a lot of time, what do we do when we get back from a run or a call? Sometimes we grab what's in the kitchen, whether it's leftovers, whether it's a snack, just something. So the only exception I'll say to this is if you come back from a really big call like a fire or something where your nutrient needs are depleted, that is absolutely an exception. But for those calls, medicals, those shorter runs, absolutely stay away from the kitchen and go back to bed. Do not eat. Water you can drink, of course. Um, eating late at night, we know that that's associated with higher blood glucose levels. We know that that's associated with type 2 diabetes higher cholesterol, increase in fat storage, sleep disruption, it disrupts when we're able to sleep, and also poor digestion. You know, if we're looking at our metabolism, if we're looking at our circadian rhythm, we do not want to be eating at night. Our guts don't want to be storing food at night. So for firefighters, digestion is also a common issue. We know that if we're putting food in our bellies after, let's say, 8 p.m. at night, it's sitting there because that's not when our metabolism wants to work. It wants to be doing that earlier in the day. 
So a little bit more on circadian rhythm. What happens when it's thrown off? As Dr. Crane said, that is that part of the brain that's responsible for so many important functions, including the produce, production of digestive enzymes. Those are the things that actually break down the food, get it moving to where it's supposed to be. If these functions are interrupted, we know that it affects our ability to properly break down food, which can also leave us feeling hungry. It can also lead us to gain weight and a whole host of other detrimental health issues. So the goal is really to align our eating and sleeping habits to batch up with our body's natural tendency that goes along with eating when it's light out, sleeping when it's dark out, the best that you can. So switching gears to talk about post-exposure and how to help your body detoxify from toxins after it's been exposed at fires. Water, abs and we'll go into these in a little bit more detail, but water is number one. Sweating, so whether it's exercise or the use of saunas, particularly infrared saunas, we know are really powerful for detoxification. Focusing on your sleep, restoration, reducing alcohol, decreasing salt, and supporting glutathione. And what's glutathione? So glutathione is an antioxidant produced by our body that aids in detoxification. So glutathione-rich foods are gonna be spinach, avocados, asparagus, okra. We also wanna focus on eating sulfur-rich foods. So sulfur helps produce glutathione, so that's gonna be any of the cruciferous vegetables, garlic, onions, also focus on vitamin C. Vitamin C increases glutathione by attacking free radicals, so which spares glutathione. So vitamin C, citrus, peppers, berries, again, cruciferous vegetables. Um, one study showed that taking 500 milligrams of vitamin C a day increased glutathione and red blood cells by almost 50%. So a word of caution, if you are gonna start supplementing with vitamin C, recognize that if you take too much, you're gonna have some GI distress. It can cause some upset, so you'll know when you reach that point. But you know, around 500 milligrams, if you are gonna supplement, is good. If not, these foods, especially peppers, red peppers, are really great for vitamin C. Selenium, which is a glutathione cofactor. It's needed for the glutathione activity. So this is gonna be found in beef, chicken, organ meats, fish, brown rice, Brazil nuts are all really rich in selenium. Turmeric and curcumin can also help increase glutathione levels. You know, unless you're eating a lot of the stuff in smoothies and juices, this is something that often does get supplemented with. Um, and sleep. Sleep is one of the things that is also needed to increase glutathione levels. And why I love the symposium is you're going to hear the same themes throughout the day, which is really important. Um, milk thistle, the active con um, compound silymarin, has also been shown to increase glutathione levels. This is something that oftentimes does need to be supplemented with as well. So water. I could spend all day talking about water. It is so important for all systems of our body. We re it regulates our body temperature. It helps with organ and joint lubrication, helps with digestion and absorption. It aids in detoxification, gets that waste right out of there. Our cells are constantly being repaired, and to function optimally, they need water. So all of these processes release the waste products, urea and CO2, and they're harmful if they're not eliminated out of our body. So again, we need water to help usher them out. So how much water do you need to be drinking a day? Half of your body weight in ounces of water, water. Not carbonated water, not anything else, just water. So if you're 200 pounds, that's 100 ounces of water a day. So if we're talking about those small changes, you know, if you're at 30 ounces of water today, maybe you go to 40 is not to jump too high up so you're not cursing my name all night in your sleep, but just a little bit at a time. Your body will adapt and it will adjust, and it's really great once you get there. So reducing alcohol. <laughs> Between 90 to 98% of alcohol is metabolized in the liver and it's broken down into acetaldehyde, which we know is a known carcinogen. So why is it bad to drink alcohol after an exposure to a fire? Well, the problem is, is that after you're exposed to various chemicals, carcinogenic chemicals at a fire, your body, your detoxification system, your liver, needs to be focused on removing that from your system, not from removing alcohol. But alcohol is so toxic that it's gonna prioritize removing that. So one of the things is in the fire services, I know it can be common practice after you have a big event or a big call to go out for some beers. It is really important that we start changing the dialogue about this. Just try to refrain from alcohol for at least the week after a big exposure. It can do a lot of good. 
You know, I hate saying don't drink, don't drink, but just like we say don't smoke, don't smoke, we know that. Like alcohol is pretty bad for us, we know that, especially with cancer and fire services. We know that drinking too much will damage the liver too, which again has that if we're talking about cancer, if we're talking about fire services, we need that liver to metabolize these carcinogenic compounds out and we can't do that with a broken down liver from alcohol. All right, number four, getting rid of processed foods. So processed foods are high in things like sugar, sodium, unhealthy fats, oils, particularly hydrogenated oils, trans fats, so looking at the ingredients for label labels, partially hydrogenated something oil or hydrogenated something oil, that's what I'll tell you trans fats have. So colors and additives too. We know that processed foods are really inflammatory for your body and linked to a whole host of those scary conditions, including cancer. So these conditions can harm the organs in our bodies. Again, we need these organs for the detoxification to get all the carcinogenic materials out of us. Optimized gut health. Over 75% of Americans are living with digestive issues. An imbalanced gut is linked to chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, inflammatory bowel disease. So much of what we do during the day impacts our gut microbiome, and keeping the gut in good shape will help keep our liver, that major detoxification organ, in good shape. So how do we do this? Water, drinking half your body weight in ounces every day. Fermented foods, so you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, yogurt, Greek yogurt, kombucha, things like that. Beer is not considered a fermented food. Um, <laughs> Fiber, for men it's 40 grams of fiber a day, for women it's about 30 grams of fiber. A lot of us are not getting enough fiber and we need that for overall health. So I like to say that is a great small change that you can make, is just focus on increasing the amount of fiber in your day. Dental hygiene, we know that dental hygiene is linked to our gut microbiome as well. In daily movement, getting out there, moving the body. So watching the sodium intake, this is particularly important post-exposure, why? Well, we need water to remove toxins from our body, right? Water moves toxins throughout those cellular systems, pushes them along. Too much sodium increases water retention. Now is not the time we want to be holding things in. Now is the time we want to be flushing stuff out. So again, I'm really talking about that one week to two week post-exposure. This is when we really want to focus on these measures. The average American consumes way too much sodium, so that is absolutely something that we want to look at controlling as well. So the top cancer-fighting foods to include the cabbage family food. These are known as the cruciferous vegetables. So broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage, all those. Garlic and onions, soy in its whole food form, so edamame and tofu flaxseed fatty fish, and other sources of omega-3 fatty acids, spices, herbs, especially turmeric and curcumin, green tea, berries, tomatoes, and citrus fruit, all really powerful cancer-fighting foods. So I know this is really confusing. We're throwing a lot at you. So I wanted to sum it up with our kind of best advice for overall health. Drink half your weight, body weight in ounces in water every single day. Aim for five or more cups of vegetables. As Dr. Crane said, this is something we could all use help on. So many of us aren't getting enough. You know, small changes. I love seeing at the breakfast buffet this morning, there were egg cups with vegetables. That's great. What I say to people is if you like eggs in the morning, just throw a couple handfuls of spinach. Just think about where you can constantly be adding them throughout your day. There's a beautiful fruit basket over there. Just grab an apple, have that. It's not that you can't have the chips or the nuts or anything else, but try to have the produce first. Try to get that in. Challenge yourself to see where you can get five sources a day. You know, also, like, if you have traditions in your house, pizza night Fridays, let's say, it's not that you can't and you shouldn't be doing that. That's really important. It's just think about doing things like maybe ordering a salad as well, right? Eat that salad with the pizza. Think of ways to increase the produce in your day. Stop eating at least three hours before bedtime. And again, do not eat in the middle of the night when you're on the job, please. Less snacking. Snacking is one of the things that stresses our digestive system out. Three meals a day, one to two snacks max, you are good to go. Stress as least amount as possible as you can, and we know the importance of sleep. So thank you guys so much. Dr. Kane and I will take any questions anyone has.
Anyone have any questions? We have microphones up front. All right. Open. Go ahead, Bert. Uh, two questions. So, um, are you have you made any recommendations for performance-based dieting, and also are you still uh, moving forward or suggesting the Mediterranean diet as a key diet plan for a, a healthier nutrition plan? Can you? Is this one on? It is on. So the Mediterranean diet, I think, is my, I didn't get into different types of diets when I was talking. However, I do think that the Mediterranean diet is probably the best. When you think about the cancer-fighting foods, the Mediterranean diet has all of those foods in abundance. And so I think if you ask me to pick one diet pattern that I, if you, if you put me on the spot and said pick one, that would be the one I would recommend. So yes, I do think Mediterranean diet is an outstanding diet pattern. Uh, what was the other question? Optimizing performance diet? Yes. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so with optimizing performance, one of the big things, the first thing I'll always suggest is water, really important, and then getting, making sure that you're getting adequate protein and fiber. So with protein, you know, if you're looking for about 30 grams at a meal would be a really good start. Um, and then, you know, fiber, all of those things, really important for blood sugar stabilization to help with performance, to help with, with everything. Is that, did that answer it or, okay. Great questions. Over there. Yes, yeah, so um, I understand the conflict with, or where you guys are coming from with the sodium reduction for trying to flush the system. Um, as far, I see a little bit of conflict with the application of that. Um, from a performance standpoint, like post, post scene, trying to make sure that you have electrolytes and all that. Is there an alternative to that maybe with uh, like heat, heat therapy, like sauna use um, as an alternative for flushing the system? Or have you guys seen that the reduction of sodium seems to be um, more beneficial? Fantastic question, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, absolutely. So you're like electrolytes after, you know, with performance nutrition. No, I'm not talking about that. When I'm looking at sodium, I'm so glad you mentioned this. I'm looking at more processed foods. So watching the sodium intake from canned foods, from packaged foods, from things like that. But no, absolutely keep those electrolytes up, and it's a really good point. So thank you for making that. Yeah. No worries, thank you. So bad to get up here in the front of everybody when you know you've gained like the COVID 28 or 35 or whatever it is the last two years. Just want to say something. First of all, um, I saw tofu on the. Is fried tofu okay? Fried. In what? <laughs> now, what's going with it? <laughs> just, not even. Don't even have to address that. Um, just want to say just a comment. Thank you so much for the information. Uh, it's challenging, obviously. Uh, I'm a retiree. A one year in retirement, and um, I've watched uh, watched myself uh, metamorphose a little bit over the last uh, year and a half, two years, three years or so. So um, I really don't appreciate getting yelled at first thing in the morning like this. Okay, appreciate. It. So sorry. Question over there. No, I too mirror that same uh, remarks of uh, being a, a scolded, but I do appreciate. We do appreciate it very much, so and it is. It is very appropriate. A question on, uh, on the sauna use. Uh, I know there's, there's a lot of variations on that. I want to know if there's any other uh, research that's uh, come out lately on the use of saunas and also with the heat stress that it produces along with, that, uh, with the use of uh, the contamination issue. Um, if there's any, I'm sorry, if there's any research that's come out lately on the use of infrared saunas? Uh, yes, ma'am, because we know, that it, we know that the saunas work, but we also want to know also how it relates to heat stress and heart attacks and the issues that come along with that, because we're in that environment. We go from that heat stress with our gear on, on at the incident, and then immediately after that, we're coming back in. We're taking the stuff off, and we're going back into that same heat stress environment. So that, that rise and fall of that, if there any recent research on that? Um, I wouldn't be able to speak on the recent research of it, but I do know that a lot of fire departments are starting to use infrared saunas as way, just because some of them you don't get in that much heat and you're not staying in them for that amount of time. Um, and there's ways to control it in different parts, like you can get light parts just on your face, just on different parts of your body so you, that you don't have to put your body in that whole heat stress situation. I think that might be something interesting for folks to uh, take further look at because these are 
two interesting components and they're both diametrically opposed. Yeah. So it might be interesting to take a look at that. Agreed. Thank you. Last question? Yeah, just uh, coffee. So uh, for some of us, it's, uh, it's a positive benefit, you know, uh, counteracting the sleep deprivation, but also, uh, you know, maybe positive digestive um, impacts. But also, you know, you made comments about Starbucks and maybe on the sugary side, but just ca caffeine in general. That, that's a great question. So caffeine actually has not been linked to increased cancer risk unless, yeah, everyone's like, thank goodness, you've already tabooed alcohol, don't taboo the coffee. Um, caffeine is not associated with increased cancer risk until it gets to very high consumption levels, and even then, it's a weak association at best. The culprit in, and I'm glad you said this, in the Starbucks comment is the added sugars. It's the added sugars and the whole fat milk. Um, I mean, I would encourage you to think about, even if you love it and it's something you wanna go have, cut the sugary syrup pumps at least in half. You can't even, I would challenge you, you can't even tell a difference, You're just cutting them in half and changing the milk to either an alternative source milk or to a low fat, non-fat milk. That'll, that'll, and don't put whipped cream. Uh, but, but you can still enjoy it and I promise it'll still taste good. Um, but no, that's a great, great point. And actually in some uh, epidemiological studies, we actually see a reduced risk of cancer with uh, people who consume coffee and tea, so. I'd say coffee is fine. But watch your sleep. If caffeine keeps you awake at night, don't drink it towards the end of the day. And one last final one. Um, uh, great presentation, ma'am. I just have one question. Uh, recently, there is a trend of intermittent fasting. Is it something that the firefighters can incorporate in their lifestyle? I'm really glad you asked that question because where's Dr. Caban Martinez? Uh, somewhere in here. This is something that he and I have been talking about, and Dr. Soleil as well. I think it's a great potential um, diet pattern to follow that we should try in the fire service. There's a lot of, uh, there was a recent systematic review on occupational um, workers and intermittent fasting, and it did seem to suggest that there were protective effects. It's easy. It's all about just changing the timing of when you're eating. I would love it if it would also include like a Mediterranean diet pattern, but I think this is a nice area that we are just on the tip of the iceberg beginning to explore. And just to kind of go along that as well, you know, if one of the, if we're saying like don't eat at night, don't eat late at night, one of the benefits of intermittent fasting is it gives humans those black and white rules of, oh, I can't, my window, eight o'clock window, I am done. So the firefighters that I've seen that actually have the most success not eating late at night are the ones who have intermittent fat, they're doing intermittent fasting because they're already in that mentality. And there's great apps that are like low cost or free that you can yeah. use that'll remind you like start stopping your fast that are nice. Thank you guys so much. Oh, I had one. Sorry, in lieu of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just in terms of like the red meats, do you guys differentiate in between the many different ones as opposed to like a lean red meat or a fatty red meat? Difference between like a venison, a bison, a cow, or do you guys kind of just loop like the red meat carcinogens like all in together as one? Um. So not all red meat is created equal, obviously. <laughs> um, lean meats definitely, you know, trump the fattier cuts of meat for sure. Um, also the preparation of meat is really important. So we know that dry grilling meat, like at really high heats can be carcinogenic. Um, you know, we also know that processed red meats are really bad. I know in fire services, there's a big tendency to wrap meat in meat. So trying to encourage people to just pick one meat, um, you know, and trying to stay away from those processed meats as much as possible. But the ones you listed sounded like great sources uh, to me. The, the other thing I would just add, if you are gonna grill your food, um, a marinade that contains um, a vitamin C source in it and marinating a little bit will cut those carcinogens down when you throw it on the grill. So if you love grilled food, I mean, it's at least some way to cut the exposure. Great, thank you. Thank you both so much.